Something kind of crazy happened this morning uh, on the way to church. And uh, Abigail's raising her hand. She was part of the craziness. Uh, she, her wheelchair, I don't know, uh, probably weighs at least 30 pounds, maybe more. It's made out of metal and, and plastic and carbi- carbon. Uh, and it was in the back of my pickup truck. The tailgate was up. Everything was going fine. And we're driving down Mopac. I get, I'm going probably 60, maybe 65. And I see my rear view mirror, her wheelchair pick up and fly out the back of, <laughs> back out of the pickup. I've been putting her wheelchair in that pickup for three years, numerous times. And never had in a million years would I ever thought that there could be a wind gust or something could happen that could blow that wheelchair out of the back of my pickup truck. It was like slow motion. I happened to see it just in my rearview mirror. And fortunately, uh, there was somebody following us that we actually knew who was able to come to a stop right, like it flew out of, the, out of the back, it landed on its side, it didn't even go, it stayed in the same lane that I had been driving in, and it just slid, came to a stop on its side, and he came to a stop right in front of it, hazard lights, we were able to get the wheelchair um, off the road, her friend Jeff, and get, you know, it, it, nothing was broken, nothing was missing, uh, there's some road rash on one, on one side of the wheels, and uh, you know, I'm going to have to write the wheelchair company and say, you make a pretty sturdy wheelchair. (laughs) Uh, That is for sure. And it kind of reminds me about seven years ago, I had a a, a laptop that I put on the top of my truck and I was driving down Mopac and it flew off uh, a a laptop and it hit, uh, I didn't even know what happened on that one. And on that time, uh, it, uh, three days later, I get a phone call. And they're like, is this Matt White? And I'm like, it is. Uh, do you have an iPad? Uh, or not a, it wasn't an iPad. It was actually a laptop. A laptop? A Surface Pro? Yeah. I can't find it. He goes, yeah, I was driving on Monday. I was driving down the road and I saw a laptop on the road. <laughs> and I was in traffic. So I just stopped and put it through it in my seat. And it kept on going, and then I didn't really look at it until the next day, which was Tuesday. And I opened it up, and, you know, it was like a screensaver, but it had your, it was an, actually it was an email. It said, Pastor Matt White at Gmail. And, I, and it was an email, and I called this number, this, this guy, and he met me on that Wednesday, that Wednesday evening. So it had set on the side of the road, Sunday afternoon, Sunday night, all day Monday, and Tuesday morning is when he found it. It had flown off. uh, That's how it happened. And I use it to this day. And it got a little road rash underneath it. Evidently, it must have helicoptered off the top, landed flush and slid. The screen wasn't even cracked. I didn't have to take it to get it fixed or anything. And then get rained on. It ain't and all those. Anyway, my point moving here with this is there are times in our life where Life doesn't go as expected, or it has some really crazy surprises. And sometimes these surprises can be good surprises. Who likes good surprises? Like, oh, hey, guess what? Happy you know, you know, birthday. We, we love good surprises. But there are times in life that we can have our plans. We can, we can have all these things happening, and then they're not very good surprises. They're, they're things that come up that we did not expect that can be devastating and challenging. And in the book of Peter, Peter understands that there are times that we're going to be going through life and there's going to, we're going to come up on what we call suffering. And it's really hard as I've been studying 1 Peter, when the big part of the subject of is, is how to handle suffering when you're going through. And last week we talked about the, the primary way Peter mentions that it's in our salvation. It's understanding that no matter what goes around us, we're secure that Jesus has paid a great price. The Father has predestined. He has selected us. The Holy Spirit sets us apart and sanctifies us. And, and that truth and that reality, even though we're going through hard times, it should give us a joy inexpressible. It's called, Peter calls it our living hope. This is a reality. But then at the same time, I read this and I think I don't go through much of suffering like that. I mean, I know that yesterday I was working a lot outdoors and this morning I'm, I'm sore. 
But that's, I mean, come on, I have to really start scraping the barrel to find, to identify with suffering because I work too hard outdoors and now I'm sore in my muscles or my back. That doesn't seem like enough. Like, I don't need to necessarily need to go to the scriptures because I'm suffering in my, you know, being sore. I need to take a couple Advil maybe later or, or, or do something like that. Not this kind. So I said, God, help me to understand, like, how can we identify with this? And he, with this? And he took me back to the very beginning of 1 Peter. I know we covered some of the first chapter last week. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, really it's in verse 1, he says, this letter is from Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And I begin to meditate upon that. That's usually an introduction. I don't spend a whole lot of time on that because it doesn't seem like, you know, let's get to the good stuff. It doesn't seem, I mean, everything's Bible. It's all gospel, but that, it seems like there's other parts of the Bible that are a little bit more gospel than just what I just read. But I began to focus and begin to study on this. I said, God, help me. And God began to draw and remind me that one of the primary purposes of Peter, it wasn't just to identify with suffering. It was his audience, the people that he was writing to. And that his audience were more than likely Gentiles who had become Christian. Now, there were some Jews that had become Christian. But they were living in the area of, uh, uh, that was under control by the Romans. But they were a very, very, very small minority. Very small compared to everything else. And he calls them, when some versions say aliens or, or foreigners or strangers. And not only were they going to get ready to go under a lot of persecution, a lot of suffering. They were also marginalized. They were also alone. They were also, they were a minority an extreme minority. And really what Peter is writing to this population is how should they live in the midst of the times that they have been given? How should they live when the Roman government is anti-Christian? When just to confess your faith could mean persecution and suffering. And in some ways I look at this and I have to think of, okay, I know that in other countries this is, this is very real. Now, 1 Peter is about suffering. And, and to be honest, I think I've you know, been a pastor for a number of years and talked with a lot of people. And, and it seems like when you think of, oh, what's your favorite book of the Bible? What's your favorite book of the Bible? Uh, generally, 1 Peter doesn't make the top 10 list of favorite books of the Bible for most believers here in America or in countries that don't deal with a lot of suffering and persecution. But I was reading a story about a professor who was teaching in a class and teaching on First Peter. And, and he, uh, a couple people came up. One was from Sudan. One was from uh, a, a Middle Eastern country. And they, they were shocked and surprised. And, they, and their community of believers in the suffering, that it's extreme persecution, they said, First Peter is one of the favorite and most sought after books in our country. Because it does deal directly with how to handle persecution and suffering. But if we're not dealing with a lot of persecution and suffering, I don't think it means that we have to go seek it out either. And I'll be honest. It's like, okay, God, am, am I not being Christian enough because I'm not suffering? Do I need to, you know, do I need to start yelling at people? You need Jesus and pointing, you know, do I need, you know, no, I don't think I need to actually start. I don't really think I need to look for a fight. Not that I should be afraid of one. But really, I don't think it means that I have to get militant and somehow, oh, I'm not suffering. I must not be doing enough. But at the same time, I said, God, there could be a way of like, we do need to be prepared that, that Lord, you know, I, I always have to, I get real careful when I am, or I'm very aware when I'm, uh, I say picking sermon series. I pray that the Lord shows me. I don't know that I'm just picking them, but maybe a, a play on uh, you know words. But nonetheless, because if I'm going to preach through suffering, I said, God, don't give me too many fresh, relevant illustrations. Please don't. You know, <laughs> if I'm going to preach on prosperity, God, give me as many fresh, relevant 
Sermon illustration. I want to talk. I'll prosper. Give me all the messages. For, you know, I want to live this one out. I want to come to the pulpit and say, just this week, and just share five or six different testimonies that support the truth and reality. But when it comes to suffering, uh, maybe not. Time out. Hold on that one. If we're going to be dealing with these things. But I have been wrestling with what Peter is telling the church here. This church that is alone. They're in the minority. They're, they're not... Uh, they're disenfranchised. Their, their identity. And one of the big purposes I believe that Peter is trying to communicate to these people in these areas that I think we can connect with is how are you to live as a Christian when the world and the place that you live via the government later on, the, Peter talks about honor the king, you know, pay your, you know, uh, t you know, Talks a lot of things related to the government, how they should connect with that. But also, also in society is how should we live in, this, in the state that we're in? How are we to be as how are we to live as Christians here in America? How do we take it there and bring it to now? In other words, how does what does it mean to have an identity? A true Christian identity in the midst of an anti-Christian society. And so with that very long introduction, I want us to go down to verse 10. And Peter is talking about the salvation that was God done for them. And he says this salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about. When they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the spirit of Christ within them was talking. About when he told them in advance. About Christ's suffering and his great glory afterward. They were told that their messages were not for themselves. But for you. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is all so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. Interesting here. Our salvation is so grand, so wonderful, so mysterious on certain levels that even the angels in heaven ponder this and wonder about it. Now, why would angels ponder this? Well, when the archangel Lucifer rebelled, there was no plan of redemption offered him. The angels were not given a plan B. They were judged and condemned and it's done. And so they, had, they have no understanding of this. And the mysteries surrounding this. That he's done for us what he did not do for them. And that's why it's even, even more so clear in Hebrews when he talks about, he makes the strong, strong case that Jesus was not just an angel. That he was more than, much, much more than that. He was, he was God. That even the angels are eagerly watching these things and as they play out. So we have this great salvation. How do we live in this in, in this? Understanding How do we as 2023 living in Austin or the Austin area metroplex, how do we, whether you're 18 years old or 81 years old or even younger or older, somewhere in between, how do we respond to this? And Peter gives us some very clear application. I'm not here just to inspire you by the Spirit of God this morning. I also want to give you some running order, some, some action steps. And Peter does the same thing. And the first thing he says in his verse uh, 13, he says, so prepare your minds for action. Other version says, keep sober in spirit. Prepare your minds for action and, ex and exercise, exercise self-control. So you're living in a country. This is the people here. You're living in a province that's overrun by the Roman control. That you're a minority of the minority. Persecution is there and is more is a common. How are you to live? He says very clearly, prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control or be sober in spirit. 
How do we do this? How do we exercise our minds? How do we stay alert? Prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. I tell you now, I live in a time, who was, I don't know who I was talking with the other day, but just how much access there is to so much more sin in this world. It seems like it's such more accessible than it was when I was growing up in the 80s. There's, uh, you know, all the beauties of technology has yet, it has also magnified the accessibility to just as there is so much good and, you know, so many great things that can happen. On the flip side, it can also be very, very evil. Very, very bad. And that accessibility comes with a high cost. And we're hearing more and more of, of young children that are becoming addicted to pornography and addicted to just, just the phone, even if it's all uh, uh, no, nothing adult related to it. Just that media and that connection that they're, they're going through. There's kids that if they don't have their phone on them, they're, they're going through withdrawals. They're going through, I mean, anxiety and their separation anxiety. And there's these, they're, they're just plugged in. And there's a lot of things that we, when it comes to this world, that we are to be of it, but we're in it, but not of it. He says, prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. It's interesting that self-control is one of the fruit of the Spirit. And we as believers, we have to understand that he says we have to be alert. We have to be sober. Sober doesn't just mean that you're not drunk. Really here it means to be alert. Eyes wide open. Focused. And exercising self-control. And we're in a generation now that is so much, especially the society, the culture that we're in. As long as it feels good, do it. And as much as you want, as long as you're not hurting anybody else. As long as you're not driving after you do all that drinking, as long as you're not, you know, <clears throat> getting anyone else, you know, all this stuff that's out there. Oh, pornography can't hurt you. It's just, you know, it's one of those, you know, da da da. And it just don't, as long as it doesn't hurt somebody else. And these are lies. And we as believers have to exercise self control. He says, prepare your minds for action. How can we do this? Only through the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. You cannot stop looking at pornography in your own will. You cannot, you can't stop allowing the lusts of the eyes without the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. In verse 2 of chapter 1, he says, The Spirit who has made you holy. The title of this, the big part of this series has been set apart. Sanctified means to be set apart. You need the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit in your life to give you the fruit of the Spirit, self-control. Self-control is worked out by, through patience and endurance. And there's these qualities that only the Spirit of God can imbue. Your own self-control cannot resist the sinful desires and urges and pleasures that are out there that we know as believers we are to avoid and stay away from. But also, I don't think Peter is telling them in anywhere throughout this letter that, oh, you know, different Christians at different times of life have looked at this and said, okay, our, when we, how do we interact with society? <clears throat> there are, I think of the, uh, I grew up in a town in northern Missouri named Chillicothe. Chilly what? Yeah, Chillicothe. And about 45 miles to the north is a little Amish community. And I would always like to drive out there every so often to go to the general store and eat enough in all these, you know, homemade <clears throat> things. And, you know, as you're driving out there, sure enough, you're hoping to see a horse and carriage. Uh, the last time that I was out there, uh, I was driving down the highway and it's going through a lot of country to before you even get to this town. And there was a little boy and he was on a, a little mini pony. And he was running that pony as fast as he could. And I just immediately thought if that boy was. Anywhere else, he would be riding on his mini bike. He'd be riding around on his motorcycle. But he had his little pony. And it was a long stretch. And it was interesting. I saw him ride it like just. And then he turned around and zoomed it down the other direction. He didn't. He, he was playing with his pony. I mean, he was just having a grand old time. But the Mennonites or the Amish have this idea that they, they, they have to remove themselves from all of society. I don't think that's what Peter here is saying either, as he 
unpacks as we move on to the rest of Peter. But that's how do we interact with society? It's it's not that we just say no to everything. You know, the oh, technology is bad. You, you know, they don't use cell phones and electricity is very limited and this, that and the other. But we are a part of society. And Peter here says to be a part of this society that you're living in, you're going to have to be self self use self-control and you have to be alert. And the reason you have to be alert, because Paul unpacks this a little bit more in Thessalonians in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, when he says, verse 6, So then let's not sleep as others do, but let's be alert and sober. He uses the same phrase here, sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let's be sober, or let's be alert, let's be self-controlled, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Paul understands this as well. How are we to live in the society that we're in? He said you're going to have to be self-controlled and you're going to be sober. You're going to have to be alert. Paul says here, there's many that go through life sleeping. I've seen it over and over again. I was watching a Netflix commentary the other day about a guy who um, got into his car in the middle of the night, drove across town, went into this lady's house and murdered her. And then, according to him, he woke up. He had been sleepwalking. And the whole case was whether or not is that even possible, let alone is it true. Sleepwalking. That in, under certain circumstances, or there are people that do have that sense of, you know, that, that, that sleepwalking state, that consciousness where they're, they're going through the motions, but yet... They don't fully understand or recognize that when I was a kid, a lot of times we do this as children. You know, uh, I slept walk some when I was a kid. And one time my mom told me I, I, uh, I, I was living upstairs or my room was upstairs. And <clears throat> in the middle of the night, she said, I heard, she heard me like run down the stairs, <clears throat> run into the living room, walk up to, to her. And, he, and, and, and I go, my, my head hurts. And I was running my, rubbing my stomach like I had a stomach ache, but I was telling her my head hurts. And she said, well, and then she realized, you know, I was like, I don't think you're really awake. <laughs> Go back to bed. And yet we have often in our own lives, I see it time and time again where there are parts where we're sleepwalking through life. Paul here is saying you, you cannot sleepwalk through your life. We must stay alert. The temptations that are in this world as believers, you have to understand that they're everywhere. And you can assess yourself right now. How well are you handling the temptations that are around us and around you in this world that we live? We must be self-controlled. We must be alert. We must prepare your minds for action and ex exercise self-control. Your eyes are the gateway to your soul. The lusts of the flesh well are war within us all the time. And if we're not careful, we're sleepwalking. We're not being alert. And we're actively involved in things that we know that God has said, nope, that's not for you. Stay out of it. Get out of it. Don't look at it. Don't stare at it. Don't even be close to it. Don't be around it. And yet we are walking in these things. We're, it's like we're sleepwalking in the spiritual sense. There's a lot of people that are spiritually asleep. I'm not saying they're, they're not saved. I'm saying they're spiritually asleep. How do we stay alert? In this times that we live. What is, how do we do this? How do we keep alert? One of the ways is we know that the world has a way of thinking, you know, pursuing the good life. We have to be careful not to let the values of this world become our values. And if you are not alert, and if you're not focused, then you are already asleep. And you are allowing the, the values of the world to determine your values. The good life. 
I mean, I'm the first one to say, I mean, who doesn't want a good life? You know, what a, a life of ease, a life of comforts. And, and we are so blessed in America to have access to these things in, in a relatively easy way, in an easy manner. And if we're not careful, we will even let these things become a distraction and lull us to sleep as Christians and as believers. We need to wake up. You need to wake up. You need to have a sober mind. You need to be alert and to be ready. And act. that, that alertness means you, your eyes are on a, your head's on a swivel. You know what I'm talking about? You're, it's like you're going, you know, the faster you get in a car, the more focused you get. Because, you know, you've got to really stay there. The slower you go, you have a little bit more time to look out and enjoy the scenery. And there's too many people that are sleepwalking in their walk with God. And it's allowing sins and it's allowing things to creep in and to take over. And I pray that this morning it become a wake-up call for you. It reminds me of the scene out of the uh, Wizard of Oz. Who's seen the Wizard of Oz? And there's a scene in the Wizard of Oz where Dorothy is almost there. She has gone. She has not been caught by the Wicked Witch. The flying monkeys had their shot. They didn't get to her. And she sees the city off into the distance and all that separates her from the city where the Wizard of Oz is supposed to be is this huge flower field, field of flowers. Oh, the easy part's done. And so they begin traipsing through the flowers, but little do they know that there is a spell. There is a sleeping spell attacked or attached to these flowers. She lets her guard down. And as they begin to walk, eventually they all fall asleep. It wasn't the flying monkeys that got them. It wasn't the dragon, or not the dragon, but the lion. It was, that's, that's a different movie. Is what she thought was going to be okay that got her. And when we are sleepwalking in the spirit realm, it makes the sins in this world become more like fields of flowers than the wicked witch and the evils that we can clearly see that are right there in front of us. And they, lull you, they will lull you to sleep, spiritually speaking. And when it comes to your salvation, only God knows just how far he will let you go. And how far you can go on whether or not there is a chance to come back. Only God knows that. And it is important that you understand that it is a season that we are to live in. That we are to be alert. And we are to be ready. And we are to exercise self-control. It is one of the fruit of the Spirit. And oh, we need self-control. And this is time as never before. We need this self-control. How do we then? What is another way that we can be alert and be sober? And be aware of what's going on around us? I mean, some of the simple things, this may not seem that spiritual. But there are things that, I, that have helped me. And I do believe that they are application for what we're doing here. One of the ways that we don't fall asleep is you got to take a, you got to, you got to get your caffeine. Now you've probably never heard of it this way, but the Bible is like caffeine in that way. You know what I mean? Amen. The more of the Bible you take into your life, the more alert and ready you're going to be when it comes to the world around you. And as the older I get, I realize I can go, you know, certain days it's just, oh, I need that four o'clock, that three o'clock. Red Bull or Monster or Diet Coke. Anyone else here this way? Every once in a while, you just got that. You hit that. Uh, on Sunday mornings, I get up a little bit earlier uh, than I normally get up. And boy, I hit that wall hard around 2 o'clock, 2 or 3 o'clock, where I'm like, oh, if I can't take a nap, I'm going to need an energy drink. And in the spirit realm, many of us are walking around. And we've been lulled and we're half asleep. And the only way that we're going to get alert, the only way we're going to wake up is the Word of God. The Word of God. 
It is our spiritual B12 shot that brings us to vitality, that wakes us up. The Bible uh, doesn't refer itself technically as caffeine at all, but it does, Bible does say that it's like, uh, it's the washing of the word, that the, as we read the Bible, it makes us clean. It makes us, in other words, it takes out the gunk. It takes away, it, it shows us, the Bible is like a mirror, and that it shows us what's wrong, what's bad. It wakes us up, it makes us alert to the areas of our life that we need to deal with, that God is working on on us. It encourages us in these things. And just like most people here today, you took a shower and you got dressed and you'll probably do the same thing tomorrow. And only on rare occasions will you go more than a day or two without showering. How much more important it is for us to be in the word of God, for us to be in our time in his presence. That's like bathing in the spiritual realm. It's like, the, it's like energy, spiritual energy. It makes us alert and ready so we can handle, not be distracted, and not fall asleep on the task that God has before us. Where are you at in your diet on the Word of God? In your reading of the Scriptures? In your study and meditation on God and His presence? In your prayer time with Him? You know, uh, a few weeks ago, I sent my mom a, a picture on her phone and she said, I didn't get it. I said, OK, here, I'll send it again. So I sent it right away and she waited a few minutes. We're talking on the phone. She goes, hmm, I never I, it's still not coming through. I said, that's odd. I've been sending pictures to different people throughout. You know, I had sent that picture two or three days before and she said she hadn't got it. So I sent it again while we we're on the phone. It still didn't go through. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. I said, can you do something for me? She said, sure. I said, uh. You'll have to hang up, but you can call me back. I said, I want you to turn your phone off and turn it. I, I know I asked her, I said, when's the last time you, you turned off, rebooted your phone? And she said, I don't remember. I said, okay, just do that. Turn your phone off, turn it back on and call me back up. So two minutes later, she calls me back up. She goes, yep, got the picture. What had happened was uh, phones are just, you know, uh, real smart computers. And there are times that you need to, there were updates, there were things, there were, there are times that it has to reboot in order to fix itself and straighten things out. And one of the quirks or one of the things that wasn't doing at that time, it wasn't, it was not allowing her to receive pictures. I don't know the science behind it. I don't know any of that. I just know that when she rebooted her phone, it worked, it started working fine. And when we get into the word of God, when we're spending and reflecting in his presence on Sunday mornings, these are like those spiritual reboots. These are times where it then allows God to speak and to pour into our lives and to get rid of all the gunk and to work on areas of our life that need to be addressed. And the longer we go without spending time in his presence, the longer we go living in this world, then the longer we are, the more sleepy we're getting, the further into the, the, the lily fields that, that uh, the flowers are going to make you fall asleep. And the more sleepwalking in the spirit realm you're going to be doing, even though you drove to church today, even though you're sitting in your seat, even though most of you look like you're listening, many can be sleepwalking. And they're listening to, it's like a student who doesn't like to be in class and this teacher's talking, they're not in their head, but they're nowhere in, you know, they are not in the building. In school, they, we call it presenteeism. And we also call that in the workplace. People show up to actually, oh, they clock in, they're working, but they're doing anything but work. <laughs> Present teaism. And there's a lot of Christians, I believe, in this world today. In areas of even my own life I was looking at, and I want you to reflect upon your eyes, that their present teaism is happening in the church today. They dress up, they show up. They know the boy the by there. They know how to speak Christianese. They know how to you know shake a hand. They know how to hug a neck. They know how to. They know a few scriptures here and here and there. But they are sleepwalking. They are present, but they're absent everywhere else. They're going through the motions. And are you here today? Are you present? But really, you're not here. Your mind is completely somewhere else. You're only here out of duty. You're only here because your husband or wife brought you. You're only here because you want to see a friend later. And there's different reasons. All those in and of themselves are not bad reasons. But if they're the reason, then yeah, it becomes a problem. So Peter is addressing the foreigners, the aliens, the people who were living in a, in a culture that was not their own. And the very first thing he says to them, 
after he encourages them about their salvation and that that's where the hope is. Their salvation, what God has done is going to carry you through no matter how bad it gets. There's going to be some suffering. Christ suffered for you, but he saved you with a work that he said it's a living hope on the day when Christ comes back, you're going to be see him. He said, that's where it's test. That's where it's at. And then he starts giving them some, okay, now until then, here's how we're going to walk this out. And he says, be alert, prepare your minds for action. Don't sleep, walk in your walk with the Lord. So I'm going to draw this message to a conclusion. And I just want to share with you. How awake are you? Use this time to allow the Holy Spirit to, to minister to you, to show you what areas of your life you're asleep in the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will, will show you. He will, he will prompt you. Even now as I'm speaking, I pray that He is speaking to you of areas that you have fallen asleep. We're living in a society in a time that God is not wanting anyone to perish. That there is a calling and a purpose and a plan. And that calling and that purpose at times will involve suffering. There will be hard times. But don't use those hard times in the world that we live in to say, oh, I'm just going to check out. I'm just going to sleep through it. Wake, you know, it's going on a wrong road trip, taking a couple of Dramamine and say, wake me up when I get there. And yet in the spirit realm, there's some Christians that have done just that. And God, I'm praying that for myself, God, help me to wake up into the areas of my life that I've allowed to fall asleep. Oh, that's not so bad. Oh, that's not no big deal. Or this, that, or the other. And we have our ways of justifying. We have our ways of figuring you know, these things out. God, that God will wake you up. God, wake us up. Because there's a work to be done. There are things that God wants to do in and through your life. Not just for yourself, but there are people that God wants to minister through you. There's lives that God wants to touch through you. Your children, your co-workers, strangers that you meet in the, in the grocery store, wherever it may be, and you're asleep, and they're passing by, they're passing by, and you're sleepwalking. And God cannot get through to you because no one's home, spiritually speaking. We must be alert, church. We must prepare and equip our minds for action and be sober and vigilant. Peter later on in the chapter uh, four, I believe he says, be on the alert. One of the ways we're to be on the alert, he says, your enemy is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Stay alert. That's one of the ways we stay alert. Later on, he talks about just in that, knowing that there is an enemy out there, the enemy of your soul, who comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And we have to be alert to his ways so that we know how to come against them. Be alert, church. So let's close our eyes. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I pray now in Jesus' name that we see and hear from the message that Peter is delivering. He's getting into some application here. We must be alert. We must be of a sober mind. We must exercise self-control. And if there's anyone here today that is recognizing that they've been asleep, that in Jesus' name, that they pour into your word call out to you in prayer and that you begin to wake them up wake them up heavenly father to the realities and the truth of your word and may we not justify our sins may we not excuse our unfaithfulness may we not become comfortable with these comforts that the world offers and they distract us and that we would fall asleep in a field full of flowers with the gold, with the heavenly 
place off in the distance and we're, we're asleep. Strengthen us by the power of your might. In Jesus' name I pray.